counter candidates outside of the traditional WIMP window between 10 GEV and 10 TEV. So, um, so we're going to in particular be looking beyond the vanilla uh, weakly interacting massive particle uh, paradigm and discussing uh, what's required from a model and uh, focusing in particular on how one detects it. Okay, so. This slide has appeared a few times already. Um, you know the usual picture of dark matter is that it's going to say the weakly interacting neutral uh, particle, supersymmetry and axions with the bill. But it may not be that the universe that we live in looks that way or is that way. Uh, and it may be that the dynamics in the dark matter sector is more akin to uh, what happens in the standard model where we have a large variety of fermions and uh, forces. Um, and so there may be some kind of complex dynamics that's sitting here in the hidden sector. And we want to think about what kind of uh, theory space lives there and how we design experiments in particular to look for those hidden sectors. So our thinking has shifted. Why? Why has our thinking shifted? Uh, and I think it's analogous to the classic lab post problem in some ways. So, uh, in order to go and look for dark matter, we have to know where to go and look. Uh, we have to design probes that are targeted to where theories say uh, dark matter candidates should live. And uh, we've had uh, one very, very well illuminated probe. Uh, going after the WIMP paradigm, and uh, a second, less well uh, illuminated, but still uh, illuminated uh, probe going after axions. And what we're trying to do is to really shine a light on the entire rope. Okay. Each, each part of that uh, theory space, we'd like to try to um, push down uh, and really uh, try to see whether there might be a dark matter candidate that was there. So uh, the theory community and the experimental community has responded in the last decade. So if we think of this uh, general picture where we have the standard model over here, highly accessible to us, some barrier, some connector sector that lives between the two, and then uh, a dark matter sector whose structure is not yet known to us, People have responded with a wide range of theories to populate this. And you can just pick out, you know, there's now hundreds of papers on this subject. But the structure that you can put there uh, is quite diverse. Uh, and this is just a, a small sampling of the space. So you can rapidly become overwhelmed, I would say, by the theories. So how is it that you should organize your thinking about this space? And from my point of view, we really need to organize our thinking about it, uh, keeping our, our focus very centrally on uh, detection mechanisms. Okay? And when you start to think in that way, the diversity um, becomes uh, more concrete or more manageable. So let's talk about the connector sectors first, and then we'll talk about the dark matter sectors. So the connector sectors, you can, uh, you can organize them by uh, the, the height of the barrier, the energy at which the connector particles appear, whether it be at the grand unified scale, at the weak scale, or through uh, particles with mass well below the weak scale. So uh, in the case of uh, grand unified, uh, very heavy mediators, for example, those could be motivated in the context of asymmetric dark matter. However, those operators which transfer the interactions between the two sectors um, are not going to be visible in low energy experiments. For that, we need to uh, look closer to the weak scale and below. So at the LHC, for example, uh, especially as the traditional WIMP searches have um, been pushed to the limit, uh, more and more people are considering how is it that we look for a complex hidden sector through weak sector dynamics. 
So for example, you can imagine producing a Z prime or an off shell Z that decays into the hidden center, say to two, in this case it's represented as two pseudoscalars, which then decay into quartz. And because uh, this decay can be very weak, the lifetime for these particles in the hidden sector can be quite long. And there are now searches that are ongoing looking for particles that decay with macroscopic lifetimes. And then at the lower mass scale, so at mass scales well below the weak scale, there's now an entire suite of experiments that have been developed to search for dark, dark matter and dark sectors with a scale well below the weak scale. So this is a, a, a kind of by now classic plot, which will appear a few times over the next half an hour. So it shows the effective coupling to the electron here, that's the, the effective coupling squared versus the mass of, in this case, um, a dark photon is typically used as the benchmark, and starting at a GPD and going all the way down to the energy range. And I'm not going to go into the details on this plot. The gray are existing uh, constraints, and the colored ones are proposed experiments and re uh, uh, areas that can be constrained in this parameter space up to 2021. Okay, so you can see that there's actually a, a whole community now that's springing up looking for dark sectors. So, um, so let's go into this in, in a few more details. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, three specific types of experiments where one has a dark matter, matter sector and just extends it in the most minimal way possible. So let's add a dark force and see what the implication would be for direct detection intensity experiments like the ones we just talked about and dark matter self-scattering and hidden shapes. So let's first go into direct detection. So let's imagine that we've added some new dark force. I'm just going to represent it here as a vector that interacts with either electrons or nucleons via the scattering process. I can calculate the spin-independent scattering cross-section and you can see that even for relatively small coupling constants, because this mediating particle is relatively light and the momentum transfer is pretty low in these experiments, the direct detection uh, cross-section is quite large. Now, why isn't this ruled out yet, a cross-section that big? Remember, 10 to the minus 39 centimeters squared was uh, ruled out by seven orders of magnitude for a typical neutrino dark matter particle. Why isn't this ruled out yet? Smaller mass. So what we're doing in the direct detection plane is pushing, looking at dark matter candidates that reside below the weak scale. And those types of dark matter candidates typically deposit energy that's smaller than what can currently be detected. Okay. So we'll talk more about that in detail. Now, once I put in this one simple interaction, so I've only put in I have my dark matter particle and have just extended the dark matter sector by one particle, as soon as that, I, it gives rise to many effects. So you can have this, uh, the dark force that allows now for this annihilation process, similar to E plus C minus, goes to two photons, and it allows for self-scattering. In addition to also being produced in intensity experiments. So, the connection to the intensity experiments, and this is really an important point to hammer home on um, the LHC experiments, is that in general, dark sectors are more efficiently produced, these low mass dark sectors are more efficiently produced in low energy intensity experiments. And that's for this very simple reason that the cross section just scales in the limit, you have a very light meteor, scales like a couple to the fourth on the energy squared. So, what you want to do is to be able to produce the mediator as close to on, on shell as you can. So, low energy, very intense beams are the best way to do that. And so, uh, most of these experiments, or many of them that you see on this plot, to look for uh, light forces are typically of the form. You have uh, some target, which is fixed. You have a very intense, for example, electron beam, which recoils off of this fixed target, and then you can radiate this new force, relatively new force, it's a relatively light new force, off of um, the, the electron beam. Uh, and in addition, so it's, um, 
So the constraint, all the constraints on this plot then, it stops, you'll notice at an ending V, because this dark force can now decay back to V plus and minus, and you look for it in the visible chain. Now in addition to looking for it in the visible channel, you can also imagine that this dark force decays if it's heavier to the dark matter. And in that case, what you have is a much more challenging experiment, because you can't reconstruct the resonance anymore, but you have a missing momentum experiment. Uh, why, why don't you use uh, the sequence that I said that A prime is part of that, it's just a mediator or it's not part A prime is just a mediator, it is not stable. Yeah, so in general, uh, it, I mean, if it's heavier than the, than the E plus E minus, then it'll decay very easily to E plus E minus. If it's lighter than E plus E minus, even in that case, it can mix through the heavier states of the tape, for example, to neutrinos. What if it's lighter than neutrinos? If it's lighter than neutrinos, then it becomes a dark matter candidate itself, right. if it's thermally produced. Typically, if I have a, a very light dark photon, then, uh, it affected, then the dark matter that couples through that state effectively behaves like a milli charge. And there's actually quite strong constraints on that scenario because now dark matter self-scattering is mediated through that light force. And that puts a constraint on the alpha, the effective coupling of the dark matter to such a light force. It depends on the mass of the dark matter, but uh, it's in the, if I recall correctly, 10 to the minus 10 level. Okay, it's very strong, very strong constraint in that case. Very strong. Because, um, again, that comes back to what we were saying about why the CMB puts a, such a strong constraint on the millicharge. It's because it's a Rutherford-like process in that case. So the cross-section goes like one on B to the fourth. So you get an enormous enhancement from the fact that dark matter is still relatively cold in the table. Okay. So really, uh, and we'll talk about, well, I'm not sure if we'll talk about this, so let me just say it now, is there's a complementarity between these intensity experiments and the direct detection experiments. Because the direct detection experiments live naturally at very low momentum transfers, and so they're extremely good at probing very, very small couplings between a dark matter coupled to a light force mediator, which then couples to electrons or nucleons. Okay, and so they put extremely tight bounds on that. What these um, accelerator-based probes do well is the probe states that are relatively massive in comparison have sort of smallish couplings. So if you go back to the previous plot, you'll see that the kinds of couplings that they probe are kind of in the 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 kind of range, uh, which are small, but is not 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 12, which is what the direct detection experiments do really well at because they live at the low momentum transfer. So, uh, so you can look for this um, relatively massive or force now, either through visible decays or invisible decays. If it's invisible decays, it's this missing momentum experiment. None of the, so uh, there are some current constraints at the moment. The strongest one actually comes from the LSMD experiment. Uh, the bar actually also places a constraint. But there's a proposal called the LDMX experiment to search for dark matter in this mode. Now the other interesting thing to note about this is you can see that if you take this diagram and you turn it back on its head, and you have dark matter annihilating to E plus E minus, that's going to fix the product of these couplings. So you can imagine that the observed relative density, if I have a thermal freeze-out process, is going to also be related to the production process here. And in fact, that's what we see here. So, you, so it depends in her, on the precise nature of the dark matter. Here they took a Dirac or a pseudo Dirac dark matter particle annihilating through this dark photon to E plus E minus, and it gives a line here in this parameter space. And so it gives a benchmark that these experiments can go after in this model space below 10 GeV but above 1 MeV. So on the line you get the right relative abundance. On the line you get the observed relative abundance, correct. Yes. So that fixes the combination, which is the product of the couplings and this um, uh, mediator mass. It's um, degenerate, 
uh, in the, because it's a different momentum transfer. So actually in this plot, they fix any time I need to be three times the dark matter mass. So this, this plot, this line will move somewhat depending on what the, the ratio, that ratio is. The point that I want to make is that you get a definite prediction that you can go after in these uh, intensity experiments. Do you get too much and too little on one side of the line? Yeah, so if the coupling is larger, then you're going to get too little, and if it's below, then you'll get too much. Okay, any other questions on this? Can you get up for that? Uh, branch trawling from from the dark photon. Uh, so you can have the if the dark photon decays visibly to E plus E minus, then you can get Brem off the charged final states. Well, so the the kinetic mixing is what will allow the state to decay back. It's you know I suppress this this effective coupling here is the kinetic mixing parameter. Yeah, I suppress that because there's a basis where I can rotate away the kinetic mixing and just write it down in the mass basis. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can translate. Uh, so in addition to this, and, and I already um, alluded to this, you can uh, set the relative abundance and then have uh, as well self scattering. And so let's talk a little bit about this last process, uh, how the uh, constraints from dark matter self-scattering play in. Okay, so as many of you already know, dark matter interactions, as we've already said, uh, uh, will randomize the momentum and isotropize uh, dark matter halos. So this goes back a long time, it goes back 20 years. The uh, gradation in our understanding of it has increased a lot. Um, it's still not theoretically under control, or I should say it's not under control yet in simulations. But the under, you know, sort of the underlying effects of what happens, our understanding of that um, has become refined, but the, the basic principles are the same. So if I look here uh, at the density as a function from the distance from the galactic center. So the, the solar system sits about 8 kiloparsecs from the galactic center, and uh, if you have no self-interactions, the um, halo tends to follow something like an NMW profile. Now what happens if I have self-interactions is a dark matter particle that's on the outside of the halo, as it passes through the center, if it interacts, will impart some of its momentum to dark matter sitting in the core of the galaxy. And when it does that, it gives the dark matter in the core a little bit of a kick, and as a result, it tends to puff the core of the halo out. So that's what you see here. As you increase the interaction cross-section, the central density decreases uh, because you've imparted some kinetic energy that tends to, to drive the, the uh, central core out. What this plot doesn't show is that if you wait even longer, you get something called a gravithermal collapse cat catastrophe, where uh, you actually uh, form a core that's even uh, more um, more cuspy towards the center. So the, the general feature at late time is that uh, at these sort of moderate radii, you puff the halo out, and at the very center, you produce a, a, a dark matter spike. Okay. But the point is that if um, you're able to observe uh, the density profile uh, in um, in uh, galaxies, you can put a, a constraint on the size of the dark matter self-interactions because what we see there is relatively consistent with non-interacting dark matter. Although the constraints, as I said before, are still rather controversial and not very well fixed. Okay. So, what kind of scattering cross-sections do you get? Well, this, the current constraints in the scattering cross-section are uncertain to within about two orders of magnitude, but it's on the order of 0.1 centimeters squared per gram which turns in natural units to about 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared for GEB. So now if you uh, just plug in that process through a, a relatively light force mediator, here I put in 10 MeV, I have 10 GE dark matter, I have a coupling constant, say on the order of 0.01, then you see that you get out of it also a very large self-scattering cross-section. 
And so now, if you just look at this uh, in the uh, parameter space, what this should tell you is that this is actually very natural. So um, if I look at dark matter, here this is a little bit heavier dark matter, you can extend it down um, at say 0.1 GeV and heavier, with the force mediator mass now in this MeV to GeV range. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details on this plot. You can see that you get um, resonant enhancements, like the Sommerfeld type effect here. Uh, and um, these contours <coughs> correspond to cross-sections in dwarfs, which are between 0.1 centimeters squared per gram and 10 centimeters squared per gram. So these are the range where you would expect to see very observable consequences, potentially, if we could be done with systematics. And what I want, the message I want you to take away from this plot is that it's, you know, okay, we're in log space, but this is not a fine-tuned region of the space. Okay, it's fairly generic. Fairly generic. Uh, just putting in one mediating particle uh, and a dark matter mass, which is, which is unknown. So uh, let's see how this plays into these accelerator experiments. So we saw this before, dark matter is produced through this um, off-shell dark photon. And now I can uh, look at this in the dark matter coupling to the dark photon plane. And uh, this is a, so this is a different projection than the previous plot. Uh, these solid curves are what's already been considered. This dash curve is what LDMX proposes to do. Up here, the coupling constant is too big, you hit a land out hole. This is what, um, in this plane, for this particular choice, what halo shapes can do. Now you might say, well, why is it that only cut out a very small space here? And this is coming back to the earlier question about self-interaction. This is a relatively massive mediator. Okay, it's quite a bit heavier than uh, the dark matter particle. Uh, where you tend to get large interaction cross-sections, even if the uh, mediator is even somewhat modestly lighter than the dark matter particle. Okay. So there's a complementarity between what accelerator probes can do, which very naturally probe uh, relatively heavy, and when I say relatively heavy, I mean you know, somewhat lighter than my light dark matter particle, uh, and what halo shapes and by extension direct detection experiments will be. So now let's move on to making a more explicit connection to direct detection. So again, we have our friendly force mediator, uh, and the interaction cross-section on a nucleon or an electron depends on the product of the couplings, the reduced mass, and if my mediator is even relatively heavy on that mediator mass through the force power. So we said that this coupling constant is constrained by halo shapes, this is uh, constrained directly by intensity experiments. And so now what we can do is to take that uh, plot. Uh, let me just go back and show it uh, again. These set of uh, constraints, which are already existing, on the effective coupling to the electron. And uh, the uh, existing constraints on the coupling to the dark matter, and then project it into the direct detection plane. So that's what's shown here. So these are the um, constraints on the coupling of the mediator of the dark photon to the electron versus its mass. And so now this shape gets projected onto a direct detection plane. Okay, and you can see this is where. Um, uh, super CDMS could go in the future, germanium type experiment. And this is uh, a lower bound from the requirement that the force mediator decay before BBN. And you can see that these cross sections can become very small and you're still consistent with all cosmological constraints. Now, you can step back and look at that and uh, possibly become uh, disillusioned because those 10 to the minus 55 centimeters squared is not going to be reachable with any planned experiment. Okay. 
So, but similar to the wind, uh, we want to ask, what is the most motivated part of the primer space? Let's, let's probe that, because strictly speaking, direct detection experiments won't rule out the wind either. So, let's talk about benchmarks. So, as I said, this was an, now an exploding area, a new field. Uh, of searching for dark matter with mass below the lift window. And this was a, a, a community paper that appeared about a year ago. Uh, and uh, all of these lines are proposals. <laughs> so you can see that this has become a very active area. The solid uh, one <coughs> lines correspond to um, things that are in R&D right now. So Sensei is something that's already gone on shelf, so they have a 1 gram and a 100 gram projection. These are the current constraints, which as you can see are very weak. And then there are a bunch of other proposals, so I'm going to talk about those in a little bit more detail. But the one uh, thing that I want to draw your attention to is these benchmarks. So this line right here <coughs> corresponds to a dark matter particle that has its relic abundance produced by annihilation to E plus E minus. That fixes a line here in the direct detection plane, and you can see that these experiments need to go after that. This line here corresponds to the strongly interacting massive particle, which has its interaction cross-section fixed by the fact that it has to remain in thermal equilibrium with the standard model down to the time of decoupling. That fixes the lower bound. This line here corresponds to an asymmetric dark matter particle uh, whose coupling to electrons is fixed by the fact that you need dark matter, anti-dark matter annihilating to E plus E minus. You have to get rid of enough of the, um, the anti-dark matter such that the annihilation process doesn't continue. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the thing that I want to emphasize is that uh, there are several experiments with very modest amounts of exposure Okay, we're not talking about 10 ton year or 10 ton year that can go after these very well defined benchmarks. Is there something like the, similar to the solar neutrino background for wind experiments? There is. Uh, and let's see. I'm not going to go digging for the plot. <laughs> so uh, it depends on what precisely the target is. Uh, but what you should sort of use as, not sort of, what you should use as a, a, as a benchmark is typically when the dark matter particle is lighter than a GPP, you'll start seeing the solar neutrino background when you have around 10 kilogram years of exposure. So you actually get there quite fast, and the reason why you do is you start seeing the PP neutrinos. So the other way to think about this is these are excellent solar neutrino detectors. <laughs> uh, these are excellent solar neutrino detectors. So if it would be the case that uh, you wouldn't see dark matter with these detectors, there's another, uh, a whole other direction of um, particle physics that you can cope with them. I think solar So we'll see a plot. I think the plot will reappear later on. But you can, it depends on the threshold. So, uh, for example, milli EB uh, energy threshold um, in a superconducting aluminum detector with a kilogram year exposure will have a few events. I can show you later on the spectrum. Uh, we computed them explicitly. Um, so, what about the benchmark? So, I want to just go back to this. We already saw this earlier uh, in the talks and the lectures, but um, they're going to appear again. So one example is the freeze-in. So uh, for example, we can have E plus E minus going through a light, it can, uh, let's say dark photon. I, as long as it's lighter than the typical momentum transfer in the direct detection process, I don't actually care how light it is. Producing uh, dark matter and a dark matter. Uh, this um, effective coupling of the dark matter to the, to the uh, dark photon is in this plot called kappa. 
And typically to produce it through this non-thermal freeze-in mechanism, that coupling constant needs to be on the order of 10 to the minus 10. So keep that number in your mind. We're going to see later on in some of these direct detection experiments with low thresholds, you can get that benchmark with uh, a milligram year. Milligram year. Okay. Very small. Uh, and the reason for it is because you have this huge one on to the fourth enhancement through this battery. The second benchmark, which I also alluded to already, is uh, asymmetric dark matter. So in that case, uh, you've produced dark matter thermally, so I have a thermal abundance of dark matter and anti-dark matter, but in order for it to be asymmetric, I need to get rid of all the anti-dark matter. So uh, dark matter and anti-dark matter needs to annihilate if it's heavier than uh, the electron to E plus E minus. And for this process to be efficient, it sets a lower bound on the effective coupling to the standard model. Uh, and in fact, uh, requiring this to be larger than 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cubed per second is not enough. And um, the reason for that is the CMP. So do you remember that, uh, I think it was yesterday, we said that if dark matter was lighter than 10 GeV, thermal annihilation cross-sections were constrained by the spectral distortion in the CMB. Well, it's actually the same thing here, but I need the annihilation cross-section, the lighter the dark matter is, to be even larger than 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second. And the reason is because even if I annihilate, I still have a small part anti-dark matter left over. So the lighter the dark matter is, the higher its density, the more I need to delete, deplete or delete, the, uh, the anti-dark matter component. And so as a function of mass, this is the minimum annihilation cross-section that you need to make that happen. Okay? And that's, this, the size of this annihilation cross-section is what sets that benchmark line in, uh, in those plots that we saw previously. Okay, so this is the overall picture. Uh, and this is the coherent neutrino uh, scattering, okay, down here. So you can see at uh, 10 GeV and above, okay, the, the boron 8 neutrinos here dominate, and you get into the beryllium 7 neutrinos, and then eventually at even lower energies, the PP neutrinos. And so, um, so it's the case that you start to see this background typically by the time you get to 1 to 10 kilogram years exposure. But we want to know what kinds of techniques will actually get you down to lower masses. So first of all, this, um, the typical shape of this, as we saw before, is set by the energy resolution of the experiment and the kinematics of nuclear recoil. So let's look at this a little bit more. So let's just take the very simplest estimate that we can. The energy deposition is the momentum transfer squared on uh, 2 times the target nucleus mass. Now you know that the most momentum you can transfer is twice times whatever momentum the dark matter carries. That's the absolute kinematic limit. So that tells you that even if you lower your energy resolution by three orders of magnitude from a KEV down to an electron volt, you lose once your dark matter mass drops below 10 to 100 GeV because of this really this kinematic mismatch between the dark matter and your nucleus. So you know to say that in a way. If you come in and you bounce back from the wall, you don't transfer very much energy to it. Okay, it's exactly the same thing that's happening here. You really only pick up a very small fraction of the dark matter kinetic energy because of this fact. So you really want to go to uh, lighter targets. So the simplest thing that you can do is to just say, okay, forget about the nucleus, let's look at electron nucleus. And in fact, that is the first thing that people did. Okay. It allows you to extract all of the dark matter kinetic energy from uh, dark matter if it's an NEV or a heavier. And that's about an electron volt of energy. And so this is what the proposals that are currently undergoing intensive R&D are based on. So you either have a semiconductor where uh, typical band gaps in the semiconductor on the order of an electron volt. You excite an, uh, an electron from the balance of the, con the conduction band. Okay, for example, a Sensei is a, a CCD, 
uh, silicon CCD experiment, excite the electron from the valence of the convection band. And uh, if you have, in this case, two electron sensitivity, with a gram exposure, this is what you can do. And then they have upgraded commands to go to 100 grams. And that's this proposal. So what other ideas exist out there? Well, to go to lower masses, you need to be able to lower this threshold. So what is setting this turn up here? Anybody? What's setting the turn up here at uh, around an MEV? Guess. Anything random. Maybe not anything random. I think because the uh, mass of the dark matter particle is too small, so that the recovery of the energy is also small, and uh, also because uh, maybe neutron decay background. So it's not a background. So the first part was uh, was correct. So the dark matter, which is an MeV in mass, carries mv squared of energy. So an mv mass dark matter particle carries an electron volt of energy. So, um, does anyone know off the top of their head what the band gap is in silicon? Or in any semiconductor? Any semiconductor, how much energy do I have to deposit to excite uh, an electron from the valence of the conduction <coughs> band? Energy. What? Energy. Yeah, it's typically on the order, it depends on what your semiconductor is, but it's on the order of 1 to 10 EV. In silicon, it has a smaller band gap, and it's closer to an electron volt. But that's precisely what's setting this turn up here is the dark matter, once it gets lighter than an MeV, simply doesn't have the kinetic energy to be able to excite the electron from the valence of the conduction band. So to state it another way, we need a smaller gap material in order to be able to go to lower masses. So that's the next set of ideas. What kind of material has a smaller gap? Superconductor. Superconductor, exactly. So the superconductor is almost the perfect material. Because they're, they're super pure, you can make super pure single crystals, uh, aluminum super superconductors, they're very well understood. Uh, and there's a, a fancier version of this, they're called direct materials. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the superconductor case because it's conceptually a lot simpler, even though there are some really cool features of direct materials. These are examples of small gap materials. So, for example, an aluminum semiconductor, the typical gap is three orders of magnitude smaller than what you get in a semiconductor. So if you take that same plot, which before cut off in an MEV, uh, and you uh, plot the reach uh, down three orders of magnitude, uh, the superconductor can reach that parameter space. Okay. Uh, there was one trick here, which I didn't tell you about, uh, which is that uh, once the dark matter again drops below an MEV, you pay this momentum transfer to electron mass price. But, uh, for electrons in these materials, they're not at rest. They carry a Fermi velocity, which is about 10 to the minus 2 times C. So that fact means that you can, even for masses all the way down to uh, a KDV in this case, it means that you can actually extract all of the dark matter kinetic energy, because you're not, you're not uh, interacting with the wall at rest. You're interacting with the wall that's actually moving faster than the dark matter itself. And that allows you to, to have a substantial energy deposition in the process. Uh, why do we? Why is it? Uh, why do they choose aluminum for the superconductor? Uh, so we chose. We proposed aluminum because it is super pure. It's uh, so. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the details of this proposal, but uh, but the the reason for this is that um, when the dark matter comes in. It interacts with an electron, it breaks a Cooper pair. Those two Cooper pairs now have two, I've just created two quasi particles. I've excited those up above the Fermi surface. And now I need to somehow collect those quasi particles. How do I collect quasi particles? Well, they basically need to rattle around in my aluminum superconductor, or whatever superconductor I've chosen, until I can collect them on the surface of this thing. So that means that they need to not be. Uh, captured on any type of defect. They need to have something that doesn't cause them to either lose energy or recombine so sooner than you'd like them to, sooner than the collection time. So for that, you need something that you can make ultra pure, uh, and there's really nothing better than an aluminum superconductor. Yeah. So 
a good question. Any others? Yeah. So just take a look at it. Is there already a way to the big thing on the article in the microscopic object? Is there what? Is there a way to look at it? So what's been de de uh, demonstrated so far, uh, so it has not been demonstrated in an aluminum superconductor that you can detect single quasi particles. Um, what has been demonstrated is that you can detect single electrons in silicon, um, in silicon semiconductors. So at electron volt energies, you can detect single excitations. And uh, so the question will be, and this is really the subject of R&D, is uh, what, you know, how do I improve my energy resolution to be able to detect uh, single excitations at lower energy? So already we've gone, uh, the way I look at it is the following. In the last 10 years, we've gone from 10 keV energy resolution down to 1 eV energy resolution. I think it's another five to 10 year project to get from one EV energy resolution down to a milli EV energy resolution. Now there are experimentalists who think they can do this. Now granted they live in California, so they're optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there is, I can, the, the, I have to say 10 years ago when I was talking about pushing the energy resolution from 10 keV down to one keV, there was a lot of skepticism. And we've already gone four orders of magnitude. So I think there's reason to think that we may be able to do it. There's no in principle law. It's, it is a hard experimental problem, but there's no in principle law. So, uh, so, so far, we've still been talking about um, interacting with billiard balls, either nuclei or electrons. Well, what is the next step? When the dark matter mass drops below an MeV, the momentum of the dark matter exceeds an in interparticle spacing of these materials. So um, a keV of momentum is about an inverse angstrom, which is the typical separation of atoms and materials. So that means that uh, at that point, coherent modes open up to you. So depending on what the particular material is, all materials have these coherent modes. They all have acoustic phonons. But depending on what the particular material is and what the nature of those um, excitations are, it's possible that dark matter can uh, couple to these coherent modes. So what does that look like? So let's take uh, a, an example of superfluid helium. So in general, material and its coherent modes are characterized by the dispersion. So this is a fairly typical plot, not a fairly typical plot, it is the typical plot, where you show the momentum transfer versus the energy deposition. So a very low momentum transfer, here you have a single acoustic phonon. This, is, this happens to be, I'm not sure if this is the measurement or the calculation, they actually agree very well with each other. You have a single uh, acoustic phonon, and the slope of this line is just set by the speed of sound. The speed of sound in superfluid helium is about 10 to the minus 6 times c. And the way that these uh, materials are characterized is by something that's known as the dynamic structure factor. And the reason why I'm telling you that is that it'll appear in our dark matter calculations in just a little bit. So basically, you should just think of it on this plot as the additional axis that's coming out here. And the way that they often, there are different ways that they can, they can probe this dynamic structure factor in different materials and compare it against theory. But for example, in superfluid helium, what you do is to send in a very cold neutron that scatters, uh, and, the, and that is a measure of the response of the material to an interaction with a particular momentum transfer and energy deposition. So different kinds of materials have different kinds of coherent modes. Um, so the previous slide was superfluid helium. Here's another example, gallium arsenide. It uh, has six modes, so the unit cell the Bruon zone contains two atoms, so that means there are six coherent modes, three for each um, atom in the unit cell. So there's always three acoustic phonon modes, two of them transverse and one of them longitudinal. In this case, there'll be also three um, optical phonon modes, and I'll explain in just a little bit what an optical phonon mode is. Uh, and it's true that materials with more complex crystal structures typically have more optical phonons. So here, um, I'll show you a little video, hopefully it'll work. 
This is sapphire, uh, Al2O3. So these are the aluminum and these are the oxygen. And in the unit cell, because of the crystal structure of it, there are 10 of these atoms. And so there are all sorts of modes that you can accept. So kinetic matter physicists have all these cool tools for visualizing these modes. Okay, so this was courtesy of our condensed matter theory collaborator. So um, the point that I want to make is that dark matter can come in and excite different oscillations in this material. And so our job is to figure out what the amplitude of those um, oscillations is. Okay, so let me just give you the master formula. Okay. So the interaction rate in uh, the target so this should look familiar from before. It was like the number density of the dark matter it's proportional to the interaction cross-section divided by the reduced mass squared. This is some conventional factor that just goes like the number density of the target to the mass. And now I have to integrate it with the velocity distribution. And finally, uh, the momentum uh, interaction, the momentum dependence has to go in. So the point that I want to make here and to emphasize is that the material response is sitting right here. It gets encoded in this thing that's called the dynamic structure factor. Okay. Uh, and so, as a result, um, what you can do is to work out the dynamic structure factor for various materials. Okay, this, um, and in fact, once you've worked it out for enough materials, you start to see that there's a pattern in that, that they all fatter, that they all follow. Okay, so for example, nuclear recoils, you can phrase as a dynamic structure factor where, uh, which has a quadratic dispersion, okay, with some amplitude which you can fix. A single acoustic phonon sits on, uh, the, um, on, on that linear dispersion. You can uh, excite a single optical phonon, okay, which just sits at whatever the constant um, energy of the deposition is of the phonon. And you can also um, excite anharmonic modes in these materials. And in that case, you have to calculate the probability that one phonon, one offshell phonon, splits to two or more phonons, which uh, you end up paying a momentum price for that. So now you can start working this through for different materials. But let me show you pictorially what's going on that helps you understand what makes a good candidate material for dark matter detection. Okay, so here again is the dispersion. So this is the momentum transfer. It's typically labeled by, um, by letters, but this is just a, a particular slice across the material in the momentum. It's a big <coughs> momentum space, so we just pick a particular slice to show you how the behavior goes as a function of the energy deposition. And uh, what I want to say is that dark matter, very naturally, like dark matter with mass below an MEV, tends to like to live on the, on the y-axis, so a very low momentum transfer. And the way that you can understand that kinematically is just that a typical energy deposition will go like the momentum that the dark matter carries times its velocity. Whereas uh, these modes, the acoustic phonon modes, have a dispersion that goes like the, um, the, the speed of sound of the material. And you'll notice that since this velocity is about 10 to the minus 3 times c, and the speed of sound in these materials tends to be in the 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6, that, um, that means that naturally the dark matter kinematics lives on the y-axis. That's, that's the most compact way to think about it. Okay. Obviously, what goes on when you're doing all the 3D integrals is more complicated, but that's the underlying summary of what's going on. So, now you can talk about it. Actually, it works the other way around, but uh, typically, first you calculate and then you find patterns to understand what's going on. Um, but you can do this now for various materials. So here's the dynamic structure factor, the response of the material. Here's where dark matter likes to live. And so how are you going to couple to dark matter that sits here when most of the response is up here? Well, the way that you do it is by picking two phonons that live here, producing them with a cancellation of their momentum. So you produce them back to back. And that process of splitting off 
these two phonons back to back will push you back over here, but at a phase space price. Okay, so now you can go and you can compute a rate. So here's the dark matter mass, starting from a KPD all the way up. Here is what you could do if you had a nuclear recoil process, but with a milli EV of energy resolution. Okay, so you can see here that uh, what you're paying is a kinematic suppression factor. So you still have six orders of magnitude better energy resolution than what WIMP experiments have. But still, you suffer this price of the kinematic matching. If you have the same energy resolution, but you look at these two phonon modes, you can see that you substantially increase the amount of interaction space that you have sensitivity to. And that's because uh, you don't pay the same kinematic price for, um, for, uh, for the um, interacting with the massive nucleus. However, it gets better. Okay. Let's talk about optical phonons. So I mentioned gallium arsenide and sapphire. Sapphire, because it has these 10 uh, atoms in the Brillouin zone, has an extremely complicated dispersion, okay? which nevertheless computer programs can handle. And now, the natural thing to do is to couple to all these the optical phonon modes here. So now you can compute the reach of dark matter uh, coupling to these acoustic phonon modes. So here's one GEV going all the way down to one KEV. At 10 KEV, uh, stellar bounds tend to constrain this space. And I want to point out this reason why. Okay, remember that that was a typical coupling to electrons, which was 10 to the minus 10. And this is what you can reach with sapphire with uh, a kilogram year exposure. So you can see that that covers this reason benchmark by something like five orders of magnitude. So you need less than a gram year exposure. The other cool thing that I didn't mention, but I will now, going back to this video, is um, now your, uh, um, these things are, the, the atoms are oscillating, okay? But you can imagine, I could have put a second one in here. Depending on which way the dark matter comes in and interacts with this target material, I will excite different modes. And of course, the strength of those different modes is different. So what does that do, anyone? Directional. Okay, so it's explicitly directional now. So this is what we can have for reach with a, a modulation signal with the same exposure. Okay, so now you can explicitly see the dependence on the fact that the, the Earth is, is rotating on its axis on a daily basis. So one other thing that I'd like to uh, mention is that not only can you be sensitive to scattering processes, but you can also recoil uh, off of the lattice through an absorption process. So, uh, so in this case, let's imagine you have a dark photon, or you could also do this with an axion. And um, normally, if I didn't have the lattice there, I couldn't conserve energy and momentum. But the fact that I can have the lattice there now allows me to absorb this um, dark photon against the lattice. And uh, you can, for very simple materials like uh, an aluminum superconductor, you can compute this absorption rate. But you can also relate it to uh, observe the observations. So in particular, you can relate the absorption rate to the imaginary part of the polarization tensor, which is just the real part of the optical conductivity. And that's what allows you to uh, compute the, a constraint on the effective coupling of the dark matter to the electron. So that's what's on the y-axis here. This is the effective coupling. It's a function of the mass. So again, if you have milli EV resolution, you have sensitivity to milli EV state being absorbed. And this works for dark photons. It also works for axions. So that's what's shown here. Uh, axion mass versus the, uh, the axion electron coupling. And for a kilogram year exposure, you can see that um, we sit just, we do sit in the QCD band, but we sit just above the white dwarf cooling belt. All right, so I'm going to stop there. I don't know what time it is, but I'm going to stop. I'm
take questions. Um, so I think that there's been an explosion in the diversity of ideas in the last decade and in the ideas for how we search for those dark matter candidates. Uh, we, we have um, well-developed uh, search strategy for Suzy and um, to a lesser extent, but still uh, very active axions. New ideas that uh, correspond to these series of hidden sector uh, dark matter have been developed and the, the corresponding search strategies have been developed. I think it's really important um, over the next decade as we're looking forward, we need to make sure that we finish off these searches for WIMP dark matter, which means that we need to get all the way to the neutrino background. But then after that, we can either throw up our arms, if it happens to be the case that we don't detect dark matter in those experiments, we don't know what's going to happen. If it happens to be the case that we don't detect dark matter, we can either throw up our hands, or we can say, this is the motivation for broadening the search. Even if we detect something in these WIMP search experiments, there's no reason to think that's the end of the story that we have one dark matter candidate. What it is, is the beginning of an entirely new field that um, will help us to understand what the structure is in the dark matter sector. So I think that this field is very um, active. It's gonna be, I think it's gonna look very different in 10 years from now than it looks right now. But in any case, we'll have learned an enormous about, an enormous amount about the structure of the dark matter sector and where we should continue that. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. So questions and comments. Also, the experiment is not challenged by, by the demand of being able to come Okay, so we ask questions for Johannes. You are on the forefront of getting down to the end of the Maybe you want to comment Yeah, but that's, but 
they've also shown it, uh, there's a paper recently from the Super CDMS collaborators that has shown it using a TDS technology. I can, I can show you the paper later on if you're, you're interested. How, how what? What's the plan to pick up this one? So it's, it's a heat, it's a heat source, right? So you can read out any form of heat in a transition edge sensor. So I didn't show any of the, um, I guess I didn't show any of the readout. Uh, I can also point you to a paper where we discuss various readout strategies. I'm just curious because this energy is much less than It's much less than what? Than a single photon. What do you mean? All the other components. Okay, I'm just trying to get it. You, if you manage to get this 180 degree on, you have a lot of noise that also tender picking up this on. Yeah, so you have to reduce the noise. They've already gone a long ways in doing that. They've already gone a long ways in doing that. Um, and, and there are people who think that they can reduce it further. So, for example, let me give you an example. So, um, Matt Pyle, one of the co-authors on this paper, is uh, a super CDMS experimentalist, and he's working on R&D for these experiments. And he's trying to make better energy resolution TDSs. He, by the way, is the expert on all of this. I'm the theorist. And he's trying to make better energy resolution TDSs. Uh, so what is it that can make a TDS go normal? Okay. What, what can deposit energy in TES? The answer is just about anything, including students coming out of class, pulling their phones out of their pockets, turning them on, they produce waves, and he can see that in his detector. And in fact, he can even tell whether it's an Android or an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you an idea of the kinds of things, the kinds of noise that uh, can backgrounds in these types of experiments. <coughs> I have to trust him, because I'm a theorist, that he, uh, that he can actually do that, reduce those noise backgrounds. You know, vibration is another big thing. They think that they've got that problem under control. So yeah, of course noise is a problem. Noise was also a huge problem in LIGO. But they managed to get that under control. So. I mean, one thing is the TAS to make it nice with TAS. I think the way you go to do that, I'll let you show just for this today. But it, it's I mean, then to couple this TAS to your absorber. And um, I mean, then it comes, uh, obviously, the smaller the absorber is, um, the lower the threshold is. I mean, now the, the lowest ones are if you have electron volt threshold, but I mean, to get down to the electron volts with. Massive absorber the noise is going beyond our, uh, let's say, imagination or uh, you know, it's, <clears throat> As long as we, you know, if we're to only talk about the, the TS, mm -hmm. that's the nice and the air, obviously, uh, you can calculate, but the moment you have your absorber with it, things get, you need some mass connected to it. You do, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but I think the so there, there is potentially some noise that's introduced when you couple the TES to the absorber. To collect the photons? Yeah, that's right. So there's, there's a fairly detailed actually discussion in our longer paper on these super connecting targets, uh, where yeah, you have to worry about the collection area on the surface, how long the closet particles live, uh, the collection efficiency, uh, and so forth. Yes, absolutely. I didn't understand actually in for GVs or dark matter, we detect like uh, dark matter come with new uh, interaction with new given. And here you show the S channel radiation type direct detection. S channel type direct detection? Yes, yes. Well, what do you mean by that? Like uh, Kai Kai going to dark photo, going to E plus E minus. Uh, dark matter annihilated through dark photon? Yes, yes. So the rate for that is very, very small. So you need very, uh, in order to get, uh, um, so the probability that dark matter is going to annihilate your detector 
to E plus E minus in an Earth laboratory is very, very small. Yeah. So, so you're not going to use one of these little detectors. It's much more efficient to point your telescope towards some place where you have a high dark matter density because the photons don't care. They just travel. Well, they might care if you live in a very, you know, a very big region. But for the most part, uh, photons travel. So it's more efficient to look towards some place that has a high dark matter density and have some big collection area for photons. <laughs> Very small temperature changes, very rarely. Yeah. So the technology already exists. For example, uh, they use TDSs to detect CMB photons. I, I guess the CMB photons are lower energy than an OEB, but they can detect those. Uh, but it's almost like a current. CMB photons are not, you know, <coughs> you have a huge rate of them coming into your detector. So it's a combination of the fact that you need to detect a small energy deposition, and you have to keep your detector quiet enough that the, that the TES, your sensor, your barometer, stays in the normal mode until it gets that occasional energy deposition. That's the hard part. So the TESs have been developed that have excellent energy resolution. It's the fact that you're looking for you know, this very rare event. That's the thing that makes the, that's the challenge. It's, what, what you would call a dark power. The Yeah, so this is the reason why, so we made some estimates. I didn't include any of this in here, but... Uh, correct, so, so, so typically we just assume a background of a few of the events. Of course, the curves just scale linearly with the background events. So, uh, so of course, what they're going to do first is not going to be a background-free experiment. So, th so you should expect that in the first rounds, these constraints will be worse, but then they'll get better. The dark counts will re be reduced, and you'll be able to derive better constraints. Right, so that's so there are two things that are contributing to the fact that uh, I can um, have sensitivity to um, these benchmarks with very small couplings to electrons. So I mentioned the fact that this freezing curve corresponds to couplings to electrons, which are 10 to the minus 10 on that order, uh, and yet it should produce a huge event rate. Um, even with a pretty small target. And the reason for that is twofold. One, you do get a boost from the higher number density. But that's actually subdominant to the other effect, which is the fact that low energy deposition means you're sensitive to low momentum transfer. And if your mediating particle is light, the cross section goes like one on Q to the fourth. So that means I get a huge boost in the interaction cross-section from the low momentum transfer that these experiments are sensitive to. And that's the thing that's driving a lot of the sensitivity here. So in this energy dynamic, where would be the lines of uh, the neutrino, the coherent neutrino cross-section? Where would be the coherent? The the coherent neutrino cross-section. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, it depends on what precisely the target is, but typically when your uh, exposure becomes on the order of one to 10 kilogram years, you'll start to see the coherent neutrino scattering. So as I said before, these same detectors that are looking for light dark matter could also be solar neutrino detectors.
They can see PP neutrinos. Yeah, so typically the, so the, um, and this is another, I guess this is another point that I should emphasize, is that the um, solar neutrino background tends to peak close to an electron hole. So if you want to remove the solar neutrino background, you should make an upper cut on uh, the experiment and actually go to lower energies. If you go to lower energies, then you'll actually substantially reduce the solar neutrino. So I should actually qualify what I said before. That depends on also where you put the upper part of your window. As you, you'll actually drop below the solar neutrino background as your energy resolution gets much better than an electron volt. A kind of remarkable fact. Any more questions, Katrin? Any last chance before dinner? No. Yeah. No. 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 Um, so I would like to thank Catherine a lot for his beautiful three lectures.